In a war between beastmen and vampires, the vampires have the upper hand thanks to their ability to use magic, and they start to think it will be an easy victory, but one of the vampires Castell, warns them not to become complacent, saying that they can't afford to lose in their empire's first campaign. We meet the commander Kamari as she agrees with him, ordering them all to bring her victory. But we see that it was all just a dream, as we learn that Kamari has been a shut-in for the last three years. She's a noble born into the Gansblood family, which has been responsible for producing imperial generals over the last thousand years, but she struggles to meet the expectations, because she was born without any magic, her athletic ability is non-existent, and she's also short, so that's why she decided to become a shut-in, claiming she would become a peace-loving vampire instead. However, she notices the Empire's emblem on her body, and a maid suddenly appears, which startles her. The maid introduces herself as Vil, her new personal maid, and she comments on the state of the room. Kamari is suspicious of her, but she claims to be her ally. Kamari gets up to go to the bathroom, but Vil stops her, telling her they need to get to the palace. Kamari insists she needs to pee, but Vil tells her there's no time. Her father Armin appears, and she tells him that she doesn't need a maid, but he explains that Vil has been appointed by the Empress. Kamari is confused by this, so Vil explains that she has been appointed as one of the Seven Crimson Lords. Kamari is shocked to hear this, and her father reminds her how he asked her to start working, and she said she would do it if she could get the throne, so her father ended up asking the Empress to give her a chance, which is how she ended up contracted as a Crimson Lord. Kamari has no memory of the contract, but Vil notes that the Empress snuck in the night before, kissing her in her sleep to form the contract. At the palace, the Empress excitedly greets her and tells her to just treat her like a friend. She goes on to explain what it means to be a Crimson Lord, explaining that Kamari will need to win a war against other nations every three months, and after 100 wins, she will gain candidacy to become the next Empress. But if she loses in the wars, then she will lose her head. She's given a unit of 500 men from the army's seventh unit, but it's filled with vampires who won't hesitate to betray her to improve their own rank. Kamari panics after hearing this, mentioning how weak she is, so the Empress tells her she will need to keep it a secret, and act like she's the strongest in front of her men. Vil vows to help her, but Kamari remains suspicious of her. Kamari goes to meet her unit, but she struggles to even open the door. She eventually gets it to open, but she immediately gets attacked. As she panics, she lets go of the door, and it ends up cutting off the vampire's head. Kamari is terrified by this, but Vil tells her she did well to get rid of a traitor. They enter the room, where they meet Castell and the rest of the troops. Castell is impressed that she took out the traitor in a single hit, and Kamari plays along, saying she could have handled him with just her pinky. The men think she's a savage, but Vil exaggerates her strength, saying that as a child, she killed a hundred vampires with just her pinky. Kamari thinks her lie is too obvious, but Vil thinks she's helping. Kamari goes on to address the unit, declaring herself as their new commander, but she ends up messing up her speech. We see the squad's first battle against the Lapelico Kingdom, where Kamari's forces overwhelm their enemy. She receives a report that the enemy general has been taken out and that they have won, but Kamari claims that if she had been on the battlefield herself, she would have ended things in a single second, causing all her men to be amazed and chant her name. She declares that they will continue to conquer their enemies, telling them all they just need to believe in her, and never think about overthrowing her. They all cheer for her, but she wonders how she got into this mess. A journalist named Melka comes asking for an interview, but she has way too many questions, and Kamari ends up pushing her away. She claims that the strong don't just speak with their words, but she declares that her goal is to defeat the commanders of the other five nations, and bring glory to their empire. As the soldiers leave the battlefield, Kamari looks over at the enemy bodies, but they are all magically brought back to life. We learn that there are six nations, which are all powered by a dark core, an ancient artifact possessing unlimited magic, which has the power to revive the dead and heal any wound. The central area where all the cores overlap is called the Dark Core Zone, which is where the wars take place, but Kamari finds the concept of it all absurd. The next day, Vil shows Kamari the article that Melka wrote about her, and Kamari is horrified to see that it's completely exaggerated. 
Vil attempts to tell her about the day's plans, but Kamari claims it's her day off. However, Vil starts reading a love story that she found in Kamari's bin. Kamari gets embarrassed and begs her to stop, but Vil tells her she will show everyone if she doesn't complete her duties, and Kamari agrees to do whatever she says, but Vil gets a nosebleed seeing how adorable she looks. Vil promises not to expose her, but she starts losing control as she hugs her, and Kamari gets creeped out by her. They have a meeting with the executives of the unit, and Kamari asks them what they want as a reward for their performance in the last battle. Castell takes pictures of her, suggesting other outfits for her to wear, while Melon has a rap battle with her, and the wolf Bellius decides to save his request for a later time. After the meeting, Castell finds Kamari a mystery, and reveals that he obtained a classified document about the incident three years ago, where a hundred vampires were killed. They think about what Vil told them, thinking Kamari must have been the culprit, but it seems there was also someone named Melison involved. They get outside, but they notice a masked girl in the courtyard. They tell her to leave, but she reveals that she's trying to kill the Empress. She notes that there is a barrier around the palace, so she came to check on Kamari, after hearing she became a Crimson Lord. Castell tries to attack her, but she easily stops his magic. Bellius rushes at her, swinging wildly, but she easily dodges all of his attacks. She notes how they are too weak to stop her, telling them to send her regards to Kamari as she disappears, but they decide not to report it, wanting to take initiative and investigate her themselves. The next morning, Kamari wakes up, but finds Vil in an outrageous outfit. She wonders if Vil has any shame, but she claims that she doesn't. She starts telling Kamari about her schedule, but Kamari wants to take the day off. However, Vil notes that it's the day she gets to choose a beast, and this gets her excited. They head over to the stables, and Kamari goes to pick out her magical beast. She bonds with one of them, naming it Bucephalus, but when she tries to ride it, it goes flying with incredible speed. Meanwhile at the training grounds, we see Johan, the vampire Kamari killed on her first day, thinking about how he will get his revenge on her, but Kamari suddenly comes flying in, kicking him in the head. She tries stopping her beast but gets thrown off of it, and Vil catches her. She panics as she notices Johan's body, but the other men cheer for her. Johan gets back up, claiming he's not dead, and he tries to attack Kamari once again, but Vil pushes her out of the way, and she trips him at the same time. Kamari starts to get dizzy, tripping over herself, and ends up poking Johan in the eyes. She acts like she did it on purpose, and all her men cheer, but Johan throws a glove at her, challenging her to a duel. At the arena, Kamari worries about being killed, but Vil communicates with her through an earpiece, reminding her that being killed doesn't mean she'll die. Kamari worries about the pain, but Vil assures her that she will help her. We see Johan in terrible condition, as Vil reveals she poisoned his lunch. He can barely stand, but he's still determined to fight. Vil tells Kamari to pretend to use magic, so she snaps her fingers, and Johan falls into a hole. The men are amazed seeing this, and Castell thinks she used advanced magic. Bellius notes that he couldn't feel any magic power, but Castell thinks she must also have a magic concealing skill. Kamari wonders what happened, and Vil reveals she dug 52 holes all around the arena, telling her not to move. Johan manages to climb back up, and he starts to get closer. Kamari wonders about the other holes, but Vil tells her that there are no more between them. Kamari starts to panic, begging for a timeout, but he suddenly blows up, as Vil reveals she also planted landmines. He starts crawling towards her, causing her to freak out, but he ends up passing out, and Kamari declares her victory as everyone cheers for her. Kamari relaxes with a bath afterwards, and she thinks about thanking Vil, who suddenly appears. Kamari notices her hands are injured, and she reveals she had to dig the holes manually, because she can only use poison magic. The two share a moment, and Kamari thanks her for saving her. Kamari goes on to wonder why Vil seems to be so clingy to her, but she mentions it's because of a certain crime she committed. Meanwhile at a bar, Johan is pissed off over losing to Kamari, but the mysterious girl appears beside him, introducing herself as Melisent of the Inverse Moon, and suggesting they should work together. Kamari is accompanied by Bellius and Vil to an Imperial party to celebrate her war achievements. The Empress takes Kamari with her, 
congratulating her on defeating four of the other nations in such a short time, but she claims she just got lucky. The Empress offers her a glass of blood, but we learn she can't even drink it because she can't stand the taste. The Empress is glad that things are going well for her after coming out of her room, revealing that making her a Crimson Lord was her father's gamble to help her. The Empress reminds her that she's loved, telling her she's not alone, and hoping that she won't fall into despair again. The Empress tells her to enjoy the party, but she thinks about what happened three years ago, and at that moment, Millicent appears, asking to chat with her. Kamari is startled at first, but tries to act cool as she agrees to chat. Her happy-go-lucky attitude amuses Millicent, and she starts rambling about her disgust toward Kamari for being favored by everyone around her, as she takes off her mask. She turns around, introducing herself to Kamari, and Kamari's traumatic memories suddenly resurface, while Millicent prepares to pay her back for what happened three years ago. She throws a dagger at Kamari, but Bellius jumps in and saves her, getting stabbed in the crossfire, as chaos ensues and everyone tries to get away. Vil comes running in, attacking her with her knives, while Millicent retrieves her dagger and jumps out of the way. Millicent taunts her as Vil prepares her next attack, and Kamari watches on, shocked by the situation. The Empress joins the scuffle, annoyed at Millicent for ruining her party, but Millicent declares her intentions to kill her, as well as Kamari. Hearing this, the Empress attempts to get rid of her, but is too slow as Millicent jumps back and takes Kamari as her hostage. But she is disappointed by Kamari's reaction, and she reveals that she's a part of the Inverse Moon, a group dedicated to restoring actual death by destroying all the Dark Course. The Empress tries to capture her, but she manages to retreat and teleport away. Vil checks up on Kamari, who wonders why her bully is back to torment her. A week later, Castell urges an attack on the enemy, but Vil cautions him to think calmly. It's revealed that Bellius is in intensive care, because attacks from ritual articles like Melisent's dagger have equal power to the Dark Cores and are able to negate its healing. The Council suspects that there is a traitor amongst them, because the gate used by Melisent to escape needed to be set up beforehand by someone. Castell asks where Kamari is, but Vil lies, saying she's gone out to scout the enemy. In her bedroom, Kamari recounts the intense bullying she faced from Millicent in the past, which she started for no reason. She recalls the day when she had enough and decided to fight back, but the memories of that day are scattered. While Kamari thinks that she hasn't changed from being a recluse, Vil enters her room. Meanwhile, Castell uses a strand of Kamari's hair to locate her position. Kamari is confused by Vil's actions, asking why she's so kind to her. Vil gives her an envelope containing her true feelings, and tells her to read it later. She comforts Kamari, telling her that a lot of people care for her. However, she's suddenly impaled from behind and starts coughing up blood, before collapsing to the ground. Millicent tells Kamari that this time she used a regular blade, and promises to kill her later in a more tragic way. She takes Vil with her, threatening to kill her if she doesn't show up alone at the city ruins by midnight before blowing a hole in the wall to leave. Kamari sits in her bed covered in a blanket, deciding to stay shut in forever. She thinks about ignoring Vil for always messing with her, but changes her mind upon remembering all the times they spent together, and how she never left her side. At that moment, Vil's envelope flies off the table to Kamari and she gets up to read it. Vil tells her about their life three years ago, where she used to study in the same academy as Kamari. Belonging to a poor family, she was bullied relentlessly by Millicent and her lackeys. They got bored of her one day, so Millicent attempted to kill her by blowing her head off, but she was stopped by Kamari. Since then, she became a ray of hope for Vil, but matters worsened as Kamari became the target of their bullying. She admits to being a coward, unable to return the favor until Kamari became a shut-in. Wanting to make amends, she chose to help Kamari by becoming her maid, and after becoming a maid of the Gansblood family, she did everything in her power to support her, vowing never to betray her again, promising to make her as happy as possible. Kamari is moved by her words, wondering how she could have forgotten her, and Kamari rushes out of the house to rescue her. She finds an anxious Castell, who summons the rest of the troops to begin their counterattack against the Inverse Moon. Kamari is glad to see Bellius has been healed but forbids her troops from following her into the enemy hideout since this is her battle. 
At a chapel, Millicent has Vil tied up, and we learn that Johan is her accomplice. But realizing her true intentions, he regrets working with her and asks her to stop. She proceeds to stab him as well, but Kamari enters the chapel. Kamari is stunned at the sight of Vil. She demands that Millicent return her, but Millicent tells her to slow down and starts talking about the past. We see Millicent's past, where her father tells her that she must get stronger than everyone else. A man from the divine paradise named Amatsu is called to teach her. He introduces himself and throws her to the ground. He teaches her about core implosion, a unique power that doesn't follow the natural laws. He explains that the state of the mind is closely connected to this ability, and only a few people have this power, but it's possible to acquire it through special training of the mind, which involves experiencing extreme pain. He trains her by beating her using his sacred article, so the pain isn't healed. A month passes, and they learn that Millicent doesn't have a core implosion, but she continues to train under Amatsu while being constantly compared to Kamari by her father. At the academy, Millicent learns about Vil and her core implosion. She demands Vil to demonstrate it, who explains that her power lets her see the future of someone who drinks her blood. Millicent sucks her blood, and upon witnessing Millicent's future for the day, Vil calls her pitiful, but Millicent is angered by this, and starts bullying Vil to release her frustration. On another day, as Millicent is about to kill Vil, Kamari stops her, angering her because her father always used to compare her to Kamari. She remembers her teacher's words to kill who you hate, so she bullies Kamari, but she soon messes up when she tries to take Kamari's mother's keepsake from her. She wakes up and learns that she was killed by Kamari's core implosion while trying to take the pendant, and her life is ruined when Kamari's father exiles her family after this incident. With nowhere else to go, she ended up joining the inverted moon, vowing to take revenge against Kamari. Johan gets up, urging Kamari to run away from Millicent's sacred article. Millicent tells him to shut up and shoots his leg, but Kamari blows him up using a magic stone, so that he doesn't die and can recover later on. Millicent begins shooting spikes at Kamari, who dodges the attacks by stepping aside. Kamari then deploys a shield using a magic stone, but it shatters from the barrage of attacks, sending her flying. She gets up again after looking at Vil, and throws a magic stone in the air while running towards Millicent. The magic stone blinds her, and Kamari strikes her from the back, blowing her away. She attacks with a giant boulder made from a magic stone, and she assumes Millicent has been defeated. She runs toward Vil, but she gets stabbed in the leg. Millicent laughs at her, calling her dumb for thinking she can defeat her using low-grade magic stones. She beats up Kamari and tells her to use her core implosion, but Kamari has no idea what that means. Millicent is sick of her attitude and she decides to kill Vil first. But Kamari intervenes, and in response, Millicent kicks her aside and launches a high-grade magic attack. Kamari is sent flying, colliding with Vil and falling near her. She starts crying at her inability to save Vil, but Vil wakes up, calling her the strongest person she knows. She asks Kamari for forgiveness while pulling her hand out from the spike. She drips her blood into Kamari's mouth to see her future, and she tells Kamari that she won't lose. Kamari's eyes turn red, and we see the Empress excitedly waiting to see Kamari's core implosion, the solitary crimson sky. Kamari awakens her core implosion, and starts attacking Millicent with the intent to kill, surprising her with her power. Kamari calls her a pitiful person, which triggers her, and causes her to start casting her most powerful magic. Kamari's squad arrives to help, but they are shocked to see Millicent casting special grade magic. They tell Kamari to run away, but she is easily able to stop Millicent's magic with a wave of her hand, and they all start cheering for her. Millicent attempts another spell, but Kamari slices her arm off in an instant. As Kamari advances, Millicent tries to stab her with her sacred article, only to have her other arm sliced off as well. Kamari grabs her by the neck, as Millicent regrets her past decisions, and Kamari declares that it's all over, as she finishes her off. When Kamari wakes up, she is shocked to see Vil beside her. She starts squirming around due to the pain from her battle, and wonders if they are in heaven after mistakenly remembering that she was defeated, and is unable to recall her awakening. Vil thinks about what Kamari's father had told her, and we learn that Kamari first awakened her core implosion when she was three, 
after drinking blood for the first time. She killed everyone in the room at that time, so they decided to hypnotize her into hating blood, thinking it would be best if she didn't have her core implosion. Kamari reads the newspaper and discovers that Millicent was captured, assuming that someone else must have defeated her. She asks Vil what she will do now that the past has been redeemed, so she doesn't need to act as a maid anymore. But Vil gets sad, thinking she doesn't want her anymore, and Kamari decides to let her continue as her maid, saying she will be relying on her. At night, we see an assassination of an official by a hooded girl. Vil and Castell accompany Kamari to a summoning from the Empress. Castell reveals merch he made using Kamari's face. She finds it weird, protesting to Vil, but Vil reveals she already bought 100 of them. They are interrupted by a girl, who berates Kamari for her ways of warfare, suspecting that Kamari is actually weak. Kamari doesn't know who she is, so she reveals she is one of the seven Crimson Lords, Mascarell. Vil is impressed by Kamari's guts, and how she forced Mascarell to introduce herself. Vil apologizes to Mascarell on Kamari's behalf, giving her blood buns and a Kamari shirt, but it just agitates her further. Mascarell doesn't respect Kamari, because the Empress favors her more, but she departs after challenging Kamari to spar in the next meeting. Kamari meets with the Empress Karen, who shoves a popsicle in her face, and then teases Kamari for tasting her leftovers. She casually mentions that Kamari's father was murdered the previous night, who we learn was the official from before. Hearing this shocks her, but Karen reassures her that he will be revived soon. She continues telling her that more officials have been killed by the same terrorist, including a Crimson Lord. She tasks Kamari with finding the culprit, but when she throws a tantrum for not getting any time off, Karen tells her that she will be rewarded with a week of vacation if she captures the terrorist. Karen teams her up with Sukuna for this mission, telling her to come out. They greet each other, and Kamari is shocked to learn that such a timid girl is a Crimson Lord. Sukuna wishes to exact revenge on the terrorist for killing her, and she hands Kamari a letter before running off. She introduces herself through the letter, and as we see her going about her day, she tells Kamari that she was forced to take over the position of a Crimson Lord after accidentally killing another. She wants to capture the terrorist to redeem herself for disgracing the kingdom and asks to get along with her, as she vows to work hard to make up for her weakness. Kamari finds her endearing, but is stopped by an envious Vil when she attempts to go meet her. Under Vil's suggestion, Kamari decides to use her subordinates for this mission. They reveal they're more than happy to do this task, and Castell recommends giving an award to whoever catches the terrorists, since it will raise their morale. The troops are disappointed by her proposal of a three-day vacation, but when she presents two zoo tickets to go along with the trip, they misunderstand the reward as a date with her. They rush off to catch the terrorists, while Vil is enraged by this proposition. Kamari visits Sukuna for a meeting about the terrorist, and finds her accompanied by a priest. Just as he is leaving, he asks Kamari about her faith, and gets overexcited when she replies that she believes in God. Vil tells her that the man is also one of the seven Crimson Lords, Heldia's Heaven, and he knows Sukuna from the orphanage he handles on the outskirts of the kingdom. Kamari extends an invitation for lunch to Sukuna, and she happily accepts. At the restaurant, Sukuna is glad to hear that she read her letter, and tells her that she became a Crimson Lord due to Heldius's recommendation, after accidentally killing another Crimson Lord while practicing her magic. Kamari is startled to hear that Sukuna's subordinates know she's weak, but they still choose to support her. Vil gets frustrated seeing them get along, and she urges Kamari to start the meeting. She reveals that the terrorist has a core implosion with the ability to change people's memories, so they should proceed with caution. They decide to patrol the palace at night, since that's when the culprit strikes. Kamari voices her frustrations with working so late, but since she's so loud, the crowd hears her and starts questioning her integrity. But she saves herself by proclaiming she wants to continue working even after night, and the crowd claps for her. They hear an explosion in the distance and rush to the scene, thinking the terrorist has appeared, only to find Kamari's unit defeated. Sukuna revives Bellius using her magic, who then reveals that they were attacked by Mascarell. Mascarell suddenly appears from an explosion and attacks Kamari, but Sukuna intercepts her strike. Kamari asks Mascarell why she would do this, and she claims that she's just doing her job by stopping her unit from running around and ruining the place. 
Mascarell is shocked by Kamari's incompetence and declares her decision to vote to kick her out of the next Crimson Lords conference. Later at night, Vil uses her powers to peer into the future as she reveals that the blood bond she gifted Mascarell contained her blood. She tells Kamari that she'll be denounced at the upcoming conference, which will lead to her exploding. Sukuna tells Kamari that she will take her side in the conference no matter what, and Kamari pats her head, thinking she's like her little sister. Vil asks Kamari to let her deal with this issue, and she asks for a head pat as well. Vil wonders why Kamari doesn't use violence to deal with Mascarell, but Kamari claims it's better to talk it out since she doesn't like meaningless fights. The Crimson Lords conference begins, attended by Karen and all the Crimson Lords except for one. Mascarell brings Kamari's credibility as a Crimson Lord into question, after saying that she is faking her strength, since she has never fought a battle. One of the other Crimson Lords, Odilon Metal, agrees with her, saying that Crimson Lords must fight on the front lines, but Haldius has the opposite opinion, saying that the strong shouldn't fight the weak. Mascarell brings them back to the topic, and strengthens her accusation by presenting Kamari's Academy report card. It displays her lack of talent to everyone, which leaves Kamari speechless. Mascarell accuses Kamari of becoming a Crimson Lord through connections so she can be popular, which causes the Empress to speak up, saying she had the final say in Kamari's induction, which makes it impossible to use connections. Kamari puts her feet on the table, telling Mascarell to keep talking, because it doesn't matter how much she speaks, which infuriates her, and she requests to fight Kamari, so that everyone can see her strength. They vote to decide if Kamari should stay a Crimson Lord, which ends in a draw with two votes on both sides. One of the Crimson Lords remains speechless throughout all of this, but is discovered to be dead, which causes a commotion. Mascarell accuses Kamari of killing them to save herself, but Vil secretly reveals she killed them to prevent Kamari's impeachment. Mascarell requests a formal war with Kamari, but Odolin interrupts her. He asks the Empress to let them all join the Crimson Lord's War, which piques her interest, and she allows them to do it. Back at home, Kamari is depressed, and starts imagining herself exploding after losing the war. Vil asks about her aspirations to divert her attention, and she expresses her desire to be a novelist. She tells Vil that she gave Sukuna one of her writings, but realizing that she had her name written on the back, she rushes to Sukuna to stop her from seeing it. Kamari runs to her residence in the rain, and when Sukuna sees her drenched at her doorstep, she tells her to get changed first. After changing clothes, Kamari sees Sukuna's room, filled with pictures and dolls of herself. Sukuna claims that she likes her and treats her dolls like real people. Kamari reassures her, saying that it's okay, and tells her she has secrets as well, but Sukuna reveals that she already knows Kamari is a writer. Sukuna's room doesn't disturb Kamari, as she believes they now know each other's secret. Sukuna expresses her worries over the Crimson Lord's War, but Kamari comforts her and proposes an alliance because they are friends. Sukuna is happy about this, and advises her to add Haldius to the alliance as well. Kamari wonders about how Sukuna ended up in an orphanage, and she reveals that her family was murdered. Sukuna answers her questions vaguely and suggests stargazing together, thinking that it's better to focus on beautiful things in their last moments. Back at the training ground, a soldier from the 6th unit finds the behavior of Sukuna's unit weird, because they seem strangely devoted to her, and he tells Castell that she's much worse than a Crimson Lord. Sukuna and Kamari look at the stars, and Sukuna questions her about why terrorists kill people, but she answers her own question, saying that maybe they don't have any other choice. She then asks Kamari what she would do if the terrorists were being forced to kill against their will by someone keeping their family hostage, and Kamari says she would solve the problem by going after the person holding the hostages. Sukuna goes into a slump and tells Kamari to look at the sky, but while she tries to grab her neck, she is interrupted by the arrival of Vil. Vil takes Kamari away, saying that she feels killing intent and that Sukuna is dangerous, but Kamari dismisses it as her imagination. However, we see Sukuna being questioned by someone from the Inverse Moon, threatening to kill her family if she doesn't deal with all the Crimson Lords. He commands her to check the memories of all the Crimson Lords, saying that one of them knows the location of the Dark Core, but knowing that she is too weak to defeat all the Crimson Lords, so he gives her a bottle of Cornelius's elixir and warns her about making the same mistakes as Melisent. 
Sukuna despairs due to her sufferings, which causes her to break down. She thinks about Millicent and starts looking for her, only to find her at an abandoned mansion, and Millicent is expecting her, inviting her to sit down. We see Sukuna and Millicent conversing over a cup of tea. Sukuna wonders why she's free, and Millicent tells her she has been permitted to go out due to certain circumstances. Judging from her expression, Millicent guesses that Sukuna must be there to inquire about leaving the inverse moon. Sukuna tells her that she is her last hope, and Millicent advises her to let Kamari drink her blood when she gets desperate. Elsewhere, crowds of people gather to watch the Crimson Lord's War on projected screen. The announcer describes the rules of the war, explaining that all six lords will compete to capture a crimson sphere set in the center of the castle ruins of the battlefield, and the lord holding it at sunset will be crowned the victor. She continues explaining that the order of the winners will be decided based on points collected by killing opposing soldiers, with one point for each soldier, and 50 points for a crimson lord. Each unit will fight using 100 soldiers, and the crimson lord with the lowest score will resign, while the winner will be rewarded by the empress. Kamari looks around, but finds only 30 people from her unit, as Vil explains that the rest of them died trying to kill each other for the spot to compete. Mascarel provokes Kamari and her unit using a magic stone, continuing to slander her. Castell is angered and requests to start the attack, so Kamari lets her team proceed. On the other side, a messenger informs Mascarel that all members of the seventh unit are rushing in to take her head. Meanwhile, Kamari and Vil discuss their plans after being left behind, but they are suddenly bombed with attacks, as Vil locates Crimson Lord Delphine, approaching them with his army. Vil senses their killing intent, and deduces that Delphine must be trying to take revenge under the assumption that Kamari killed her back at the conference. They flee on Kamari's sacred beast, while Delphine's squad gives chase. Sukuna who is yet to move, manipulates her subordinate using her core implosion, ordering him to capture and bring Mascarel to her. Karen and Armin catch this happening while monitoring her from an orb, and Armin calls to apprehend her, but Karen stops him, saying they still don't know the actual culprit behind her, saying it's someone currently on the battlefield. Delphine catches up to Kamari and Vil, blocking their path with a wall. He calls Kamari a liar when she says that she didn't kill him, before attacking her with daggers made of his blood. Vil tries to defend her, but gets stabbed as she tells Kamari to run. Kamari calls Delphine a coward and provokes him. He is infuriated, and creates a boulder from his blood and drops it on them. They manage to dodge it, and Vil gets back up, taking advantage of the situation. They escape while riding the sacred beast, breaking through the wall, and heading straight towards the old capital. Thinking they've escaped, they look back, only to find Delphine still in pursuit, so Kamari and Vil head directly toward the location where Heldius and Odilon are engaged in battle. Odilon orders his troops to capture them, and while dodging their incoming attacks, Vil releases a toxin that only targets men, killing the soldiers of all three lords in the area. Kamari and Vil get attacked from all sides, but they still manage to reach the sphere's location, but Delphine continues to pursue them, as he prepares his next attack. He hurls a blood sword at them, but Vil intercepts it with a magic stone, blowing it up. As the blood from the explosion rains down, some of it falls on Kamari's lips, and it activates her powers. Meanwhile, Mascarel battles both Kamari and Sukuna's units, but just as she activates her true powers, a beam of light emerges from Kamari's location, and wipes out the whole battlefield. The explosion breaks the screen projection in Karen's orb, who is delighted to witness a legendary light spell. Kamari returns to normal, but doesn't remember what happened. She finds Vil collapsed nearby, and teleports her to a hospital after confirming she's okay. Kamari looks around confused, and finds the sphere in pieces. Mascarel confronts her for killing everyone, and spots the shattered sphere next to her. This enrages her, and she activates her powers, intending to kill Kamari, but before she can finish her spell, Sukuna stops her, piercing her chest with one hand. Sukuna throws her away, before dropping a magic boulder on top of her and killing her. Kamari questions if she was always this strong, but Sukuna explains that she managed to kill Mascarel only because she let her guard down. Sukuna recalls the night they stargazed together, and notes that Kamari is truly strong for the solution she presented, but says that she can't be like her. 
She claims that she can only work as a pawn for the inverse moon because she lacks conviction, but notes that Mascarell doesn't know the location of the dark core. With tears in her eyes, Sukuna reveals her identity as an inverse moon terrorist. Kamari attempts to console her, asking to go home together, as she thinks she is joking, but she pushes her hand away. She puts her to sleep using a spell, saying she owes her the truth. Kamari enters Sukuna's mental space, which is in the form of a starry sky, with each star representing one of her memories. She shows Kamari memories of her happy days with her sister and her family, but she mentions the inverse moon, saying they'll do anything to destroy the dark course. Sukuna shows Kamari the memory of her family dying to a man with a sacred article, who wanted to use Sukuna's core implosion, which allows her to manipulate the memories of whoever she kills. The man tells her that if she works hard for the inverse moon, he will reveal how she can save her family. She's tasked with finding the location of the dark core by manipulating the memories of influential individuals after killing them. She apologizes to Kamari for killing her father, saying that she has no other way to save her family. They arrive back in the physical world, where she reveals that she will turn Kamari into her big sister after killing her, the same way she turned Haldius into her father. Kamari grabs her hand, saying that she will be her sister without being killed, but notes that replacing someone's memories to make them her sister is rude towards her actual sister. Kamari hugs her, causing her to start crying, and she recalls that her real sister used to comfort her like this. They both are happy, but Odilon arrives and attacks Sukuna, questioning why Kamari is still alive. He continues to beat her, and Kamari realizes that Odilon is the person manipulating Sukuna. Odilon commands Sukuna to kill Kamari, but despite Kamari's efforts to intervene, Odilon breaks her wrist before throwing her away. Sukuna tries to stand up to him, drinking the elixir he gave her and boosting her powers. With her increased power, she relentlessly attacks him. In an attempt to strike her from above, Odilon jumps into the air, but she alters the trajectory of her magic. He's hit by her attacks and crashes to the ground. Sukuna takes the chance, rushing to finish him off, but the side effects of the elixir kick in, causing her to collapse. Odilon laughs at her, punching her into the air, and she falls beside Kamari, but she remembers Melisent's words and drips her blood into Kamari's mouth, which awakens her, but Kamari bites her neck, seeking more of her blood. Kamari's face turns pale and her hair turns white, as she turns toward Odilon, commanding him to apologize to Sukuna. We see the Empress and Kamari's father looking at the whole fight through an orb, discussing Kamari's core implosion. The Empress says that the qualities of Kamari's power change depending on whose blood she drinks, adding that she's happy to find the mastermind of the terrorists. Kamari heals Sukuna, shocking Odilon that the side effects of the elixir, composed using a sacred article, were healed so easily. She commands him to apologize to Sukuna, but he calls her a tool. This infuriates Kamari, who throws a punch at him, completely blowing him away. Kamari vanishes from his sight before appearing beside him, freezing and breaking his arm off. He attempts to cut her down, but freezes before he can hit her. She touches his blade, breaking it into pieces. He uses a magic stone to teleport to his hideout and communicates with Amatsu, telling him that the plan has failed because of Kamari, but a servant comes forward, stabbing him in the stomach. All the servants attack him, and we learn that Sukuna used her core implosion to manipulate everyone into attacking him. He's furious that he lost everything, but Kamari catches up, grabbing him by the neck and commanding him to apologize to Sukuna. He doesn't listen, so she breaks his neck and blows his base to bits. A few days later, we see Vil taking care of Kamari, nursing her back to health. Kamari insists that Vil rest as well, reminding her that she's injured as well but she just teases her by asking to be fed by her. Sukuna greets them, apologizing for causing them so much trouble, but Kamari tells her she doesn't mind. Sukuna starts crying, thinking about how everyone forgave her mistakes, including Haldius, who overlooked her behavior even though he already knew everything and only pretended to have his memories manipulated to make her happy. Sukuna tells Kamari to punish her, so she tells her to stay with her, but Vil misunderstands what she means and glares at her. Kamari explains she received a two-week vacation for winning the war and she will be at home, telling Sukuna to come whenever she wants. She tells her to stop addressing her so formally, saying they are friends, so Sukuna takes her hand, 
while we see Vil getting jealous. We see Kamari at the beach for her vacation, but she doesn't seem to enjoy it. Sukuna compliments her swimsuit, and we learn that as punishment for her crimes, Sukuna has been made to fight in more of the wars, so she often dies from losing the battles. While Kamari admires Sukuna, Vil blocks her view, and judges her for being infatuated by Sukuna. Kamari denies it, but Vil tells her she doesn't mind, since she's happy to see her taking interest in going out, and drags her into the water with her. When Kamari goes back to relax, Vil reminds her that the real reason for their visit to the resort is to meet Nelia Cunningham, who is one of the eight generals of the Republic of Aruka. We learn that Nelia sent a letter to Kamari, which she suspected was a trap, but the Empress saw it as a chance to gauge the enemy's capabilities, so that's how she ended up at the beach with her squad, who are busy competing for a selfie with her in her swimsuit, by racing to a tower called the Daydream Paradise. Kamari still feels nervous about the tea party, so Vil assures her that she has her poison, and she gets Sukuna to drink her blood to see into the future, and she confirms that Kamari won't die. We learn that Aruka is the domain of the Warblades, who are swordsmen rumored to have bodies made of metal. Nelia arrives to greet them, serving them tea, and Kamari wonders why she invited her, since she doesn't think they've met before but Nelia says she expected her to not remember anything, and Kamari is confused by this. Nelia tells her that she wants to witness the true strength of an up-and-coming Crimson Lord, so Kamari starts boasting about her strength, which gets her excited and she asks her how many people she's killed. Kamari lies and says 50,000, which Nelia finds impressive, so she reveals her plan is world domination, saying that with their powers combined, the two of them could take over the world by wiping out the other nations. Sukuna thinks it's a bad idea, and Vil says that Kamari could take over the world by herself, so she wouldn't need to team up with her. She gets annoyed by this, but Kamari tells her that she's a pacifist, and that even if she had the power to take over the world, she wouldn't use it recklessly, and would aim for world peace instead. Belius barges into the room, reporting that their squad encountered Aruka soldiers while rushing towards the tower. The soldiers misunderstood their advance as an attack, so they started fighting, leading to all the Aruka soldiers getting wiped out. Belius calls them weak, and Nelian gets pissed off by this, but before Kamari can explain, they hear an explosion, and we see Castell blowing up the tower. Nelia feels betrayed, and pulls out her blades to attack Kamari, but Vil quickly grabs her to escape, saying that she prepared for this since she saw into the future. After getting to safety, Vil contacts the squad to evacuate the nation since it has become hostile, while Kamari wishes for everyone's safety. The Empress calls Kamari to tease her, and tells her about Karla Matsu, an envoy from the Divine Paradise Nation, who wanted to talk to her. We see two journalists, Melka and Tia, spying on Karla and learn that she's actually one of the five Imperial Sabres of the Divine Paradise. Karla tells Kamari that she's visiting to discuss forming an alliance, she explains that her kingdom is on bad terms with Aruka, and that the Empire might share their interests. The Empress confirms this, saying that Aruka's recent struggle for territory after becoming a republic is getting troublesome. The two reporters find this interesting, and explain that Aruka used to be a monarchy, before the current president, Mattered, started a revolution and turned it into a republic. Kamari asks if Karla plans to confront the enemy by joining forces, and she says that she would prefer to avoid unnecessary combat, so Kamari asks her if she believes the world would be better without wars. Carla says that she does, which makes Kamari feel relieved, as she tells her she's also a pacifist. Castell hands her a threatening letter from Nelia, which Carla finds suspicious, and she asks if she was lying about being a pacifist. Kamari tries to explain herself, but notices Castell listening, so she immediately changes her answer, claiming that she's actually a slaughterist, who doesn't understand the people who love peace. Carla feels deceived and calls the Empire a savage country, but the Empress calls her behavior inexcusable, and tells Kamari to kill her for insulting the Empire. Kamari tries to get out of it, but Castell suggests she should do it, so she tries again to not make him suspect anything. Carla tells her she's strong enough to kill 5,000 people in just 5 seconds, so Kamari tells her that she could kill 50,000, but Carla doesn't back down, saying she'll reduce the empire to ashes and kill 50 million. Vil suddenly pushes Kamari on top of Carla, who freaks out thinking Kamari was about to kill her. 
the Empress interjects, telling Carla she must ally with the Empire if she doesn't want to be murdered. Carla realizes that she has no choice, so she reluctantly accepts. Meanwhile, Nelia talks to an official who tells her she can't fail in capturing Kamari if she doesn't want to end up like her father, so she's determined to make Kamari into a servant she can use to turn the world upside down. We see Nelia being comforted by her father in a flashback, and he introduces her to a tutor named Yuling Gansblood, who advises her to not make enemies for no reason, or she will be left alone in times of need, which are words she now begins to understand. We see that Carla is just like Kamari, as she has a breakdown over her decision to ally with the Empire, due to the possibility of a war. We learn that she's also only pretending to be strong, because she was forced to act as a commander. She thinks she can ignore the requests from the Empire and stall, but her attendant reminds her that the war with Aruka is necessary, and she reluctantly agrees. Meanwhile in Aruka, we see the President Mattered, discussing news of the Alliance, saying they should strike back, but Nelia requests another chance to capture Kamari. However, another general named Rainsworth interrupts, saying that her failure to capture Kamari caused the Daydream Paradise to suffer. Nelia feels frustrated, as he tells her to give up on her plans to restore the crown, and we learn that she's the princess from the old monarch. Rainsworth tells her to give up and just live with him, but she rejects him, saying that she will expose their evil deeds, declaring that she will be the next president. Rainsworth laughs at her and leaves, leaving her frustrated as her maid Gertrude checks on her. Vil wakes Kamari up, and she sees all the Crimson Lords gathered around her on a table. She asks Vil if she's dreaming, so she tells her that since she overslept, her bed was taken to the meeting room and set up on the table. She takes her seat, and we learn that the meeting is being held in the fortress city of Foray, because of the arrival of a proclamation from Aruka. Vil reads out Aruka's declaration of war against the Alliance, with Kamari being named the Alliance leader, because of the newspaper articles of her meeting with Carla going around. Kamari complains, saying that she just wanted to avoid war and sneak to the pool, but Vil makes her aware of the other lords in the room, so she corrects herself, saying she wants to make a pool from the blood of her enemies. The Empress reveals intel she received from her scouts, that claims that all eight generals of Aruka will be attacking Foray, and presents two main goals of the war, to decimate the advancing enemies, and to destroy their military base. Carla adds that she received intel about illegal ritual articles being brought to the Daydream Paradise, and presenting proof of this to the Six Nations might force Matter to concede victory. Carla suggests splitting into offensive and defensive teams, but there's suddenly an explosion outside, and Tia and Melka watch as the city gets surrounded by Aruka's various units. We see that the room is destroyed, but the Crimson Lords were able to protect themselves. The Empress receives a call from Mattered, who says he'll withdraw his troops if she tells him the secret of the Dark Core. He says that they've allied with the Commonwealth and the Lapelico Kingdom, with the Enchanted Lands joining them as well, threatening her to surrender. But the Empress calls his current team a joke, asking him if he's in his office, as she sets off explosives she had planted there, officially declaring the start of the war. Vil carries Kamari away to safety, and Mascarell saves them from an incoming attack, telling them to get out of her sight as she blocks more attacks from another general, who introduces herself as Helia, the strongest of the six Arctic masters of the Commonwealth. Her troops break through the city gate, and with a squad of giraffe warriors from Lapelico, who destroy everything with their necks. As they approach, Kamari's troops charge at them, but get blasted away instantly, so Vil gives Kamari a remote, which causes a landmine to explode, defeating the captain. The Aruka units enter the fortress and charge at Kamari, but her troops and the other lords come to her defense, but in the chaos, Nelia appears in front of her and teleports her away. She explains that they were supposed to go to the Daydream Paradise, but ended up in an unknown place due to matter destroying the transfer gate. She tells Kamari to calm down, revealing that her teacher was Kamari's mother, and that they have met each other before. In a flashback, we see a young Kamari and Nelia enjoying desserts, and Nelia asks if she will be a commander. Kamari tells her she doesn't like fighting, saying that she can achieve world domination in other ways, by making everyone in the world get along, and tells Nelia she wants to be her friend. But Mattered grabs her and tells her to be careful around vampires, attempting to create a rift between the girls, but Kamari simply offers her pudding to him, while calling out his hypocrisy. 
Kamari finally remembers Nelia, and she tells her her plan to expose Maddard's crimes and reform Aruka by becoming the president. Kamari agrees to her proposal, but instead of shaking hands, she kisses her, saying that it's an Arukan tradition, but Gertrude denies this. Nelia tells Kamari and Vil to become her servants to help end the war, but they deny her. Rainsworth orders his troops to follow Kamari, but we see he has a sinister smile as he thinks about a way to make Nelia submit to him. Mascarelle desperately defends herself against Helia, and she manages to fight back, shooting a beam at her, but Helia blocks it with her gun. She declares that they will meet again, before teleporting away. Delphine and Sakuna prepare to go look for Kamari using Sakuna's transmitter, which she uses to track her at all times. Kamari and the others talk about the situation at a restaurant near the Daydream Paradise, as Nelia explains her plan to reveal Maddard's crimes, because he's been experimenting on the imprisoned supporters of the royal family. Vil is surprised to learn this, and Gertrude explains that she has heard screams coming from the tower during her recon missions, and Nelia adds that the ritual articles are also being smuggled there. Vil talks about how using ritual articles on people may awaken core implosions, which Nelia thinks could mean more power for matter to use. But Kamari doesn't pay attention, because she's too busy thinking about what to order. Nelia gets annoyed at her and turns to Carla, who is snoozing through the whole discussion, so Gertrude knocks her awake, while Nelia calls them useless. We see Maddard ordering Rainsworth to continue his pursuit of Kamari and Nelia, and tells him that he will mobilize the Daydream unit, which he wants him to take command of once the girls reach the Daydream Paradise. The girls wake up to find Rainsworth attacking Nelia, so they quickly jump out of the window and use a smoke bomb to escape. Vil carries Kamari away, while leaving a dead Carla behind, but Rainsworth catches up to them instantly, and manages to injure Vil, while proclaiming that he'll make Kamari his personal slave once they win. But he's stopped by Delphine, who arrives with Sakuna and Kamari's units. Kamari is glad to see them, and hugs Sakuna in joy. Vil gets jealous, and she tells Kamari to reward her with a hug as well, but Sakuna tells them they don't have time. She assures Kamari that she will handle the enemies to let her escape, and Kamari sets her sights on getting to the Daydream Paradise. We see Arukan citizens protesting against Mattered and the war, as Melka and Tia observe. Tia wonders why they are in Aruka, when their focus should be on the Empire, but Melka tells her they are covering a story that will affect the whole world. Tia points out that their news is treated like trash in Aruka, but Melka tells her that her video camera is broadcasting the footage live for everyone to see. We see Kamari's unit completely defeated, and Rainsworth prepares to follow Nelia, but Sakuna grabs his leg, telling him to stop. He stabs her, and tells her that the Abercrombie unit is waiting to ambush Kamari and Nelia, but Sakuna says that she's already won against him, which leaves Rainsworth confused. The girls see Abercrombie's body, which Vil recognizes as Sakuna's work, explaining that she killed him back when the Empress was sending her out to fight various wars, and she used her core implosion to turn Abercrombie against his own men, and they wiped each other out. With nothing left in their way, the girls head into the Daydream Paradise, where they confirm the existence of prisoners and human experimentation. Nelia decides to free the prisoners, as Gertrude brings the keys to her, but she says that they don't need to be freed, because they were fools who disobeyed the president. She drops the keys and stabs Nelia, revealing that her full name is Gertrude Rainsworth, and she's the commander of the 8th unit. Vil tries to defend her, but gets attacked by Rainsworth who reveals that Gertrude is his little sister, and that she was keeping tabs on them. Nelia wonders why she betrayed her, so she tells her that she saw her getting belittled, and her hard work going unrewarded, telling her to give up on her ambitions. Rainsworth tells her that her dream is useless, and Nelia starts to break down, but Kamari interrupts them, saying that Nelia's dream is still alive, and that people like him can't ruin it. Rainsworth becomes enraged, but Kamari says that Nelia would never lose to someone like him, telling him to apologize to her. Rainsworth rushes at her, and he starts beating her up until she coughs up blood, but suddenly, the room is covered in a fog as Sakuna appears behind him. Gertrude warns him about an enemy attack, which turns out to be the men that followed Sakuna. Gertrude prepares to fight Sakuna, and she tells Rainsworth to take command of the Daydream unit. Nelia wonders about the unit, and Rainsworth reveals it's a squad of 5,000 elite soldiers that Maddard secretly developed. 
we see Mattard being confronted by the Empress, who managed to sneak into his hideout. He refuses to surrender, but she tells him that his warblades keep losing, so he tells her about the Daydream unit, whose soldiers each have power on the same level as a general. Nelia feels useless, thinking the situation is hopeless, but Kamari tells her that they won't know who will win unless they try. Nelia thinks her goal is just a pipe dream, but Kamari tells her that even though she thought she was an idiot when they first met, but after getting to know her better, she started to like the way Nelia thinks, telling her not to give up. She tells Nelia to suck her blood, saying that it's a way for vampires to show their trust in others, and she promises to support her since she sees her as a friend who she can take over the world with. Nelia is moved by her words, and tells her she will accept her trust. She has some of her blood, and it makes her see a memory of Yulene talking about Kamari. Yulene notes that although Kamari is a troublemaker, she thinks Kamari will one day become a figure that drives the empire. Nelia awakens with newfound determination and power, telling Kamari that they will accomplish their goal. The soldiers break the wall down, as Rainsworth orders them to charge and destroy anyone they come across. Matter tells the Empress to surrender, since they don't stand a chance against his elite force, but she tells him that a squadron built on suffering and violence doesn't scare her. She says that she's only there to watch him die, as Melka's broadcast plays outside, where she exposes Matter's schemes. She informs everyone about the army of 5,000 soldiers approaching Foray, asking if the world will stand by and watch as it happens. Nelia flashes by, and releases the prisoners with her core implosion. Gertrude calls her efforts useless, and insists that she can't win against Mattered, but Nelia charges at her, cutting through her sword, and she punches her, confronting her about her betrayal. But Gertrude says she did it for her sake, revealing that she was always abused by her brother, and after being treated well for the first time by Nelia, she didn't want to see her suffer, so she just wanted her to live peacefully with her brother. Nelia tells her that living as her brother's pet isn't peace, so Gertrude apologizes and tells her to forget about her, but Nelia holds her head up and says that she doesn't blame her, telling her to just talk to her if she's unsatisfied. Gertrude is moved by this, and she declares herself as Nelia's number one servant. Carla suggests strategizing their next moves instead of rushing in, and Nelia realizes that the world must come together and stand against matter to achieve victory, so she goes to talk to Kamari, but Sakuna blocks her way, saying that she doesn't trust her. Nelia tells her that she's shared blood with Kamari, which both Vil and Sakuna are shocked to hear. Nelia remembers that she didn't share her blood with Kamari, so she cuts her hand and offers it to Kamari, telling her that she has incredible power, and that drinking her blood will help her understand. Kamari is reluctant, so she tells her that they are like sisters, telling her to have faith, and that she knows they can change the world together. Kamari agrees and drinks her blood, which makes her suddenly levitate and glow with power. She materializes a sword, which causes light to spread across the sky, and Melka announces that Kamari will save the world, lifting the spirits of the people. We see Mascarell and Heldius exhausted after defending the people and helping them evacuate, but as more soldiers approach, Millicent appears and blasts them away. She teleports her troops, sending them to fight, and Haldius realizes that she has taken command over the fifth unit. She teleports next to Rainsworth, telling him that she would kill him to make up for her sins, but decides to leave him to Kamari, who attacks with her golden sword. Nelia confronts Rainsworth, and he tries to convince her to obey him, saying he can make her happy, but she rejects him, saying she would rather fight alongside Kamari. Rainsworth charges at her, but she cuts right through his sword. Melka continues her broadcast, telling the people to rise up, and Mattered watches in disbelief. The Empress tells him that Kamari will guide the hearts of the people, as her squad teleports to her, thinking she's amazing. Carla arrives with her own troops, and she receives orders to join the fight. Helia also appears on the battlefield, but learns of the recent developments, leading to the end of the Commonwealth's alliance with Aruka, so she declares them as her enemy. Rainsworth continues belittling Nelia, but she's determined to defeat him. Kamari launches a sword at him, but Nelia tells her she wants to fight him. Rainsworth orders his soldiers to capture Nelia, and he turns his attention to Kamari. He activates his core implosion, which turns him into steel. He tells her that her attacks will be useless against him, but her sword easily stabs him. 
He's shocked by this, and Kamari launches a barrage of swords, impaling him from all sides, and causing him to revert to his original form. In a flashback we see, Rainsworth getting beat up by other kids while trying to protect his sister. He thinks about revenge against the nobles who looked down on him. He became a soldier to get stronger, but he met Nelia during this time, and she welcomed him openly, thinking he has potential. But back in the present, she tells him that while he did his best for Aruka, he put his efforts into the wrong things. Kamari tells him to repent, as she slashes him with her sword, and Mattered hears his calms go silent. He starts freaking out after seeing Kamari's power, so the Empress tells him that her idea of world domination is to create an ideal world where people can help each other. Matter doesn't believe her, saying that people are selfish, but she tells him that Kamari is different and her purpose is to guide the hearts of the people in the right direction. She tells him that people who have been saved by Kamari go on to forget the idea of subjugating others, and with more people like that, they can achieve their goal. Kamari appears outside his window with Nelia, and they combine their swords together, creating a huge beam of light that swings at him, causing an enormous explosion. We see Melka reporting the end of the war, and it seems Mattered has gone missing, so there will be an election for a new president. We see Nelia standing in the throne room, and she tells Gertrude she's late, but when she looks at her, she sees her father. She rushes to hug him, apologizing for not being able to save him, but he tells her she's become a far greater warrior than him. One month later, we see Kamari's squad fighting enemy soldiers, while competing to see who will get a head pat from her, even fighting against each other, causing Kamari to be stunned. She's sad to be fighting against Arukan soldiers, but Vil explains that Nelia is doing this to raise her reputation by defeating Kamari, so she can win her election. Nelia appears in front of Kamari, telling her to become her servant, so they can dominate the world and create peace, but Vil gets in the way, calling her cocky since she had some of Kamari's blood. Vil is jealous about this, so she plans to squeeze all of Kamari's blood out of her. Sakuna also appears, agreeing with Vil, because she doesn't want there to be someone else who has drank Kamari's blood. They all call for Kamari to side with them, but she struggles to choose between them, and she wishes she could just go back to being a shut-in. But that's where this video ends. Remember to like, and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.